Hello, hello, and welcome to today's episode of Saddest Night Out. My name is Roy, and I am the host of this daily podcast, and it's primarily about music and creative culture in London. Now, some of you might recall that I have mentioned a show I'm playing, or that I have played now, at Paper Dress Vintage. I played it Sunday, 22nd of September, and on this episode, I've only gone and bagged an interview with the headline acts from that show. I am speaking to Gary aka its own animal this episode was recorded the day after that show i went to his place and we start off by talking about how he feels about the show and very understandably he mentions that he is extremely tired after all that he put in to make sure that show went off well and it did go off well i first met gary at an open mic that i was hosting at the reliance earlier this year i've seen him at various open mics since i remember him asking at some point if I could help out with maybe trying to get some shows and that helped to turn the dial in my mind that I should put on my own shows and he was part of that lineup for that first show and that same lineup played for his show on Sunday the 22nd of September. So I've actually spoken to everyone from that lineup before. Juliet and Nanette were the opening acts and they are on episode 128. Delilah Black and Buckley are on episode 137. And I've spoken to Gary previously, but only briefly on episode 146. But this episode is his time to shine. We're going all the way back to the start and he takes us through his entire story with music. This is me talking to Gary aka its own animal settle down put the kettle on get a cup of tea and really sink your teeth into this episode i'll catch up with you a bit more afterwards but enjoy this chat i am in the home of the star of last night's show we're coming off of the back of the show to celebrate the release of their new album ammonite i am here with its own animal also known as gary gary how are you feeling after last night's show Exhausted. Um, yeah. I'm really tired. Uh, I forgot how much hard work you have to put into a show like that. Things like rehearsals, standing up on stage in hot lights and playing ten songs to people when I've got to work. All the electronics and play guitar and sing and press the right pedals at the right time and try not to stuff it up too much. And um, and the stress of worrying about, is anybody going to show up? Yeah. Are they going to show up? I'm going to be playing to an empty room, a curious old guy and his dog, you know. Which, <laughs> all right, they'll get us the best show I can give them, but it's... And it was really lovely. And, you know, is it going to be good enough for the other bands? Are they going to enjoy it? Is uh, Delilah finally going to get a decent sound because she's had <laughs> nightmares? Is Roy's band going to get a chance to shine? Is it going to work for Juliet and Annette and their delicate sound? I hope the sound engineers, you know, all of that yeah. stuff. It's and it's buzzing in your head. So for the last week, I've been I get to sleep at one, wake up at five thirty, and that is it. Bzz. I'm like a I'm like a, a wasp buzzing around my head, and I cannot stop. So I'm shattered now. But I, I loved it. I absolutely loved it. The bands that I put on were great. Uh, they were really great. Um, and I was climbing up on stage going, oh, fuck, I've got to follow that. Uh, it was okay. You were fantastic. It was really nice. I really enjoyed it. I, I was so happy because I still remember first playing with you at the Reliance upstairs when I joined you in the oh, drum Oh, yeah, pit. it was you, wasn't it? It was. And even then, I, I was really impressed by the music, but I felt there was a lot to the sound. And you know with open mics, there's a limit to how much you can really project. Oh, yeah. So it was great to see you on this stage with this sound system and really start to feel a bit more this is the world that Gary's trying to project with his music and now I can swim in it a bit more I was having a real rave in the front row there I was absolutely you loving were misbehaving. it you yeah I quite enjoyed that yeah, <laughs> yeah. I worked up a swim along I could hear you singing along that was really <laughs> nice and, and thanks for coming up on stage and beating the bejesus out of my drum pads <laughs> in the middle of that song. That was really cool. That was so cool. You started a, a, a whole verse early, but it, I didn't care. <laughs> you got, no, it's my, it's my signal leak. But it's like, we haven't had a chance to rehearse at all. Yeah, I, I was very off the cup. Oh, but so you're a good enough like, percussionist to, hit, to play that. I mean, it would be lovely to be up on stage with about half a dozen drummers beating various <laughs> things at the end of that. I think that would be so... Like, we'll get there, we'll get there. <laughs> But um, no, it's lovely. Uh, there was all sorts of lovely bits. I had four mates come from my. I used to kayak, do whitewater kayak, and then the guys who I've kayaked with, the younger guys, and me and better paddlers. Uh, 
<laughs> and they came along just because they were my mates to see and to support me. And the very best bit was in the middle of one song, Sam, one of them, was holding up a phone with the, the face of my mate Matt, who I've had many adventures with, who now lives in Australia, and he was watching it all from on Skype on Sam's phone from Australia and there was his gurning face and his face was doing I can't even say what it was like but he was doing a manic grinning like that <laughs> uh, uh, I just I could have cried I almost cried oh. I, almost, I forgot the words I just yeah. blurted the words so I said any old crap because uh, it was just I was overwhelmed yeah. and things like that and Michael coming you know a unique technique yeah coming in a cab 25 quid he's not exactly well off and insisting he paid ten, a tenner for one of the albums that I had on sale not the five I was going to let people have them for a fiver because it's not expensive to do a CD yeah. and um, no but he insisted to pay a proper amount because he thinks musicians should be paid there were all these things that really moved me you know, mm. and, the, and I got the hugs that people were giving me and your Sean beating <laughs> me on the beard front um, <laughs> Mari the sound engineer was fantastic she was really good she it's really rare that somebody gets what somebody like me is trying to do when you've got the echoey floaty guitar you've got all of that beaty stuff you've got that huge it's meant to be a huge absolutely ear filling room it's filling all encompassing yeah, yeah exactly lots of sub bass all this sort of stuff and it's kind of yeah it was to get that I'm I'm delighted and shattered and and quite emotional, really, and lacking sleep. <laughs> <laughs> As someone, um, yeah, I put on a show earlier this week. I yeah. can very much sympathise. It was yeah. cracking. It was and brilliant. thank you very I much for coming it. to that one. I as was well. so glad to come to that one. And I was jaw dropped by you. I was jaw dropped by you. But, and I, I thought your band were even better last night and sounded even better. And I thank just really like that. And I think that's a, the best gig I've seen Delilah do. Yeah. And Buckley. On Aww. guitar, that man's, something else. That guitar sounds a beast, doesn't it? It's it is just, outstanding. It, absolutely lovely, and the fact that it was so diverse and that the audience went with everything, and it was just great. I thought. So we're off the back of your most recent live excursion, and one that you hosted. I wonder if we can rewind the clock a bit. <laughs> Do you remember the first time you went to a show and got the same feeling from watching someone else do it? Yeah, I do. Um... <laughs> who was it who did I go and see uh, I went to see lots of shows I went to see lots of heavy metal shows and you get the noise and things I think it was Motorhead at uh, City Hall in Newcastle which is where I'm from and I couldn't hear properly for about three days afterwards <laughs> that sounds about right which was Motorhead <laughs> yeah but when they did uh, Ace of Spades and all that or they did Kings of Speed King or Kings of Speed or whatever uh, it was just and they did a Cut a Hawkwind song and it was just like fancy. They did Silver Machine, which Lemmy wrote. And they were just fantastic. And Filthy Animal, the drummer, was just the noise. And you, back in those days, he used to get 20 minute drum solos. He played a two minute drum solo, and he probably got more into that two minutes. <laughs> but it was just hilarious. It was just hilarious. Because as he did it, his mates were giving him the bird. The, the other musicians in the yeah. band were just and taking the piss out of them, sticking their tongues out, and <laughs> wiggling the bums out of them and everything. It was just, they took the piss out of the whole big-headed rock and roll thing, and it was yeah. just brilliant. And then it would have been uh, seeing Dire Straits play um, early on before anybody had heard of them. And, think, and you just get this buzz. But I was 17, and my sister took me to see Ian during the Blockheads in Leeds, where she was at uni. And it's still the best gig I've ever seen. It's still the tightest band I've ever seen. And I never, ever had danced at a gig before that. And I danced my arse off. And it was, this is what I want to do. It was, like, inspiring. And then I got back, and a friend of mine, who knew I was into rock and punk and reggae and all that sort of stuff, took me to say Chic and Sister Sledge at City Hall, Newcastle. And I saw Bernard Edward to play bass, and I decided I was going to be a bass player. And it was oh. just that. I was going to do that somehow. And when I started, I was shit. But it was just brilliant. To, and yeah. punk, I came to London to the punk scene mm -hmm. and saw people like the Clash. So are we talking like mm, 70s, just in general? Yeah, uh, late 70s, 70s, early... Late 70s, I think, really, is when I started to... Yeah, so be music before seriously. that, growing up in Newcastle, was that where... Uh, near Newcastle. Was... I grew up in a shitty little new town called Cramlington, 
which I told you all about last night. <laughs> yeah. Lots and lots of little triangles of grass with no That's use at all no for but as nests for dog eggs. It was just <laughs> dog poo. Every, everybody had dogs and they all let them poo in these little triangles and it was just... And you just wanted... It, it was The people were nice but you just wanted to get away so we did. 70s, um, small town in the northeast. Yeah. Was there a moment when you thought, I want to be part of that world? Like, that all... Like, no, no. Um, people talk about teenagers. The I'm 58, by the way, listeners. So I'm old enough to be a granddad, probably. And, um, or at least your devastatingly handsome older brother. <laughs> and I, uh, we knew nothing teenagers. We knew about football. We knew about... And uh, even when the Slits sang about Newtown... Everybody's kicking football, you know, sniffing television, you know. We didn't realize we thought they were celebrating football. We didn't realize they were taking the piss out of it as a kind of drug. We knew nothing, and teenagers today know so much. They're, yeah. they're much, much more ready for life than we ever were. So I came. To, my dad was a builder. I liked drawing. I came to uni to be an architect. Mm-hmm. To I did an architecture degree. Is that in London? But, uh, yeah, and I chose London, and I had a couple of choices, and I chose London because I was in love with the punk and reggae scene, so I loved mm-hmm. The Clash, and I loved Pist- The Pistols, and I loved uh, Mikey Dread, and I loved all sorts of Misty and Roots and all that, and I wanted to come to that scene, to see that scene, and uh, I think I spent most of my grant... We used to get a grant then, folks, fucking hell. <laughs> I spent most of my grant seeing bands and buying a bass. Uh, as, as I didn't eat a lot that year. This is yeah, yeah. See, well, I went to university in Huddersfield. Yeah. And I would, after rent and you get yeah. your loans after paying for rent and tuition and everything, I'd have two hundred pounds left for about three months for each term, each semester. Yeah, book a rule. So I'd be like, right, that's this many ten p packets of noodles, this many loaves of bread, and the yeah. rest is train tickets and gig tickets, yeah. and that's it. Yeah. So this is late seventies, early eighties. You're in London. Yeah, yeah. You come here to check out the the punk scene, the reggae I, scene. I came here to to do a degree and to start a life, really. And I, you don't know. I, I think it's really funny, seventeen, eighteen year old kids. You don't know no. what you want or anything. It was just it was where my soul was at at the time, where my heart was at, and I was, I was incredibly shy. I couldn't talk to anyone. I was. I had no. I couldn't have done this. I'd have just been mm. dribbling. I couldn't think of a word to say to anyone, so I'd meet somebody on a party that I thought was beautiful, and I just couldn't <laughs> say a bloody word. And I, and then I'd drink alcohol and I'd get morose. Yeah. And then other days I'd smoke a bit of dope and get less morose, but uh, none of it worked. And I was quite a lonely guy, really, really lonely. And if it hadn't been for a couple of mates of mine expressing an interest in doing a band, I, I needed something to do with people to talk about. So what was that first band? <laughs> we were a kind of punk band called Heads and Sticks, mm-hmm. named after uh, we saw this art exhibition called Aftermath, and there was this Jean de Buffet sculpture of these thin, thin leaf shapes that penetrated these little head shapes, and they were like looked like heads on sticks. It was called All the Town's Bourgeois. <laughs> and we, uh, we thought, oh, it's cool. So yeah. we called ourselves Heads on Sticks. And um, we spent three years getting any good because we, we weren't doing it seriously. Yeah. Cheap drum machine and making things and recording on cassette recorder. Then we got a four, we got a Porter Studio, which was a, a four track cassette recorder thing. And we started writing. Um, we Are start, we like drums, bass, guitar, guitar? What's drums, the ba- drums, bass, guitar, vocal. And so your a bass guy is- called Tony was from Dorset mm-hmm. who said this, <laughs> nice did this uh, well he's changed my accent <laughs> and he's got, he had this beautiful accent and he did kind of poetry so he mainly kind of rapped and half sung mm-hmm. he, he wasn't a singer singer there's a guy called Paul who was the most amazing guitarist I've ever met he could not play rhythm we used to say that everything in the universe vibrated with its own natural frequency except Paul. <laughs> but he could play tuned feedback chords. Um, it was like Hendrix couldn't do what he did, but he, he didn't play fancy, but it was beautiful. Though. And we got our main idea when I walked in this little rehearsal room that was part of college, which is now in the Bloomsbury Theatre, but it was just a college theatre then. And uh, I walked down this corridor and there was this howling sound, the loneliest sound I had ever heard 
coming down. I just stood outside the room for 10 minutes while he was making this sort of sounds and these two beautiful chords. That he, and he was sitting on the floor next to his amp with it on really, really, really loud. And his echo on and his tremolo on and it was all wobbling around the place. And I sat at the drum kit and I thought, it's a disco. So I started playing a disco beat. Because I had a mate just teach me to drum three weeks ago and I kind of picked it up quite quickly and just going tsk, 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 tsk. Yeah. Fa- slightly too fast through a disco beat and came up with a big boom, 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 bass line. Got our drummer in. Mm-hmm. He said the hi-hats are the lead tune and he started making the hi-hats and cymbals play this like tune thing and we were just kind of genius. We had a song called The Place to Wait. And we recorded it, I took it to Tony's and he had it for a day and came up with this lyric about um, not wanting the sounds of children and cries of birds to interrupt his peace that he just struggled to get and it was called A Place to Wait and the chorus goes, why won't they leave me alone? And I thought it's the loneliest fucking song I'd ever heard and that was it. So we decided disco Mm -hmm. and I like the funk and so we started doing kind of really beaty stuff and things like that so and we couldn't play it properly for ages it took us another year to be able to play it so is it all during the time you're at university no, mainly you know? after during uni we pissed around we didn't get anywhere and then we went back and we played a gig at the college union i went down really 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 well and back then you could get gigs that you were paid for yeah so a couple of weeks later we played at some place over in victoria and went down again really really well especially a place to wait and we had a thing called coil which was really funky but slightly derivative of another band at the time called they a certain ratio because i loved them and i loved kind of avant-garde funk sort of stuff and dance dance stuff so we eventually we just kept going and we eventually we got an album out through red rhino on dead men's curve records which was called second feed and uh we produced it for 30 quid (laughs) (laughs) put studio live and then we went up to their studio to mix it and um, in Leeds we spent a couple of days I think it was in Leeds mixing it and that was just great that was really good and then we and that was just fun it was just like we were 24 25 and we got interviewed by the enemy they reviewed the album called it party music for the disturbed Congrats! That feels like. Well, I think uh, that that was exactly what we, we wanted. Yeah. We, we knew that dance music. There was a desperation in dancing, and there, but there was also. So we had all sorts of songs. Tony wrote these beautiful lyrics about the. It's really current now. It's about the rise of the right, the rise of the new right. They're working behind you. Shadows are swaying where grass once grew, and all these images. He was a painter and sculptor, so these it, it was all images, and us playing this kind of thumpy funk with drum machine and drums and me on bass and tape loops and backwards recorder we could were playing a uh, play recorder and stuff like that and recording that and just having this slow down half speed and backwards in the background is the kind of ambient sort of thing and Paul with his weird and lovely guitar playing so it was yeah. now then, you mentioned that before that band yeah you were like by your own admission, very lonely, wanting to connect, but maybe didn't have the skills I had no or the idea. confidence. I had no idea. How, I Just thought that. I was something wrong with me. I thought I was. I'd um, well, uh, when I was playing, if I did sports as a teenager, I was fine. In any other situation, I was really awkward and uncomfortable, and I just thought there was something wrong with me. Mm. I just assumed that I wasn't quite real. It was quite a strange feeling. Yeah. I suppose it was depression, you know. Is it like you're in a room and you feel as though everyone else seems to be clued in? Yeah. The thing? Why can't I do the thing? You know that, that song I sang at the beginning last night, uh, Flying? Yeah. And it goes, and birds fly higher than high, suspended on nothing but air. And it's like the wonderment that other people could, could be so okay and you're yeah. not. And there's that kind of thing. And then Joy Division did that, Atmospheres and... And he sang, people like you find it easy. They get to see walking on air. And I suppose I was channeling that song when I wrote Flying. It was about, you know, trying to, that kind of, I was in that space of that loneliness. And it's got, it's been transformed. It's been transformed. I dropped out, uh, I got my degree and didn't do architecture. 
and I started doing voluntary work with autistic people and that transformed me because when you're helping somebody who has more need than you that's a fucking good feeling that is a beyond even little things that you open white wear tune somebody's guitar or put my hand on somebody's back who's shaking or tell somebody who's struggled maybe they, they weren't great but you can see the, the effort and the bravery they've gone through to do it and congratulate them and tell them you know just keep doing you'll get stronger and stronger and all this so it feels great doesn't it yeah and um, it's, in, it's interesting that you balances you yeah it's interesting that you you went that route to help others because you were very much in the 80s I think, I, was help, I, think I went to help if you're wrong I think a lot of altruism you're actually helping yourself what people think of as altruism I think altruism to me is just common sense we're social animals we need each other we're interdependent and People who say society is a competition, I think are fuckwits, frankly. I think there's no understanding of we're on one little planet. And Now, considering know, what we know of the 80s politically, what was that situation like for you? Because when oh, you're was, in the Thatcher period... I was quite active, yeah. the, uh, involved in a lot of, um, kind of protest movement stuff. The, I was in CND and they brought the cruise missiles in while they were debating in Parliament if they were going to bring, bring crews. And I don't know if you know, but crews was the first strike weapon. Mm-hmm. It could get through and take nuclear weapons to Russia and they wouldn't even know until they started exploding because they flew under radar. And they had them stationed at Lake and Heath and Green and Common and all that. So there's this huge protest by women at Green and Common. My first love spent a lot of her time at Green and Common, a woman called Lisa, who was a brilliant, ultra-feminist, strong woman. And she spent a lot there and had a lot of my walking gear confiscated. <laughs> but fair enough. But, um, you know, and they were doing some. They were doing... And there was a, a movement against the arms trade called Stop the City because there was a lot of arms trade and people selling torture equipment to South Africa. And we were kind of a bit involved in that. Sort of anarcho-syndicalist stroke kind of sweet, so un, a non-ideological kind of... St- Socialist, the sort of northeastern view of socialism, where you just think you're in it together. Yeah, and we we did stuff like that, helped out in squatted cafes. Just generally, that's what people, it's what kids did then, because the job opportunities were shite. That we didn't really have a life as yet, so we made one. So in amongst that, you've got heads on sticks. Yeah, you made the album. Yeah. You've got the enemy with you. Yeah. You're playing shows and you're being well received. And Red Rhino went bust. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think we pressed, I forget if it was uh, some weird number, something like 17,000 copies were pressed. And I think they all sold. And word of mouth, they're in California and Japan, and Belgium and uh, Holland, quite a lot of. And they just sold. And then when that album died away, we then got a little tour in Belgium and Holland, which is our own, our first and only tour. Okay. <laughs> uh, it was really nice. It yeah, was at least you got to kind of cross those benchmarks off the list, so to speak. You I, made an it album. It was never a list. We never, we didn't know what we were doing. We the world's worst self-publicists. And by that time, we had a new singer, a guy called Ben, who could really bloody sing. And we had a new drummer who came from a, a big band jazz and surf music and I had a band called Hipsway, which nearly made it, and then they broke up before they were going to make it. And then he uh, he brought discipline to us and made mm. us tight. And then I started writing funkier and funkier stuff and beating the shit out of the bass and getting it to growl and spurt and click on harmonics and things like that. And Tony had left because he'd become a dad, okay. the singer, bless him, did the right thing really. And then we started doing stuff. We hoped to get somewhere because we thought we had some really good music and we hoped to get somewhere, but we never did. And and Ben, who was our singer, he was a press officer for the London Lighthouse, so he was quite good at that stuff and knew a little bit, but we got nowhere. And then the house scene started and we loved it because it was, you'd have Gypsy Kings played against, uh, I don't know, Barry White. I'm an ecstasy when you lay down next to me, which is a corny title, but a great <laughs> song. Really massive. Played next to this house stuff. Guy called Gerald, 17-year-old in his bedroom, making fabulous dance music and all this sort of stuff. And I was into... Me and the drummer were into Steve Reich and 
um, what's it called, Philip Glass and all this kind of systems music stuff anyway, this more ambient stuff. And I'd bought synths and uh, sequences and a drum machine and I started making music like that and I spent seven weeks writing us a whole new set. So you, you started it experimenting more with electronics yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that, that's, that's why when you see me now there's a mixture yeah. of kind of real inverted they're all real yeah, instruments yeah. So that since every bit as real as my guitar or my bass or anything like that And um, but you're still writing for heads on sticks at this stage yeah but we changed the name to Hoss we just went HOS <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> we really really wish shit it we couldn't <laughs> think of names I couldn't even think of names for the songs we had a song that was just like incredibly funky and it was called Drum Box and Biscuit Tin because that's what I wrote it on. I was playing timbales on a couple of biscuit tins nailed into a block of wood on the drum stand because yeah, we didn't have timbales. And it was just in um, with a kind of ba 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 sort of bass line sort of thing and it's like um, one note bass line just slapping away on yeah. the open E string making the bass spit and growl. And Tommy the drummer Okay, but this is just fab beat, and then um, Ben started singing. It, it became prison song because he started singing about being entrapped by people's expectations of gay man and all that sort of thing, and just had a huge voice. And that's when we toured. We toured with Ben. It was a bloody diva. They had to shave his head for him every night and calm him down. But he was lovely. And Tom, the drummer, was like on stage, great. Off stage, he just went off in his own way. Yeah. <laughs> It was just, yeah, and then it all ended because we, the house thing, we got, were being played on Kiss by Andy, what's he called, who ran Shoe? Can't even remember his name now. Um, by one of the DJs who ran Shoe. And we were talking to Virgin Records. And then they were bought by Sony, and that was it. And so, 32. So. I, 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 I felt I'd done everything I could yeah. do anyway, so. Heads and Sticks slash Hoss yeah. part ways, but we're here now with its own animal, so yeah. <laughs> when does when does that transition happen? Uh, fifth, was, right, uh, 32, mm-hmm. I kind of stopped doing music, mm-hmm. uh, 35 I sold my kit, I stopped doing Heads uh, Hoss, I did some work with Ben's other band, I sing his other band, which was called Love Life, which was more like pop dance sort of thing. Um, Apart from writing Tidal away for him, which is a song I still play on with him, uh, I have to think he came up with the chords. First time a singer's come up with the chords for me. And um, then, uh, and. So, we're like mid to late 90s now? Yeah. Oh, God, how old are we? 34? Yeah, getting in there, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, no, uh, no, no, early 90s. Early 90s. Yeah, mid 90s, yeah. And then it just. We weren't going to get anywhere, we weren't getting anywhere. The scene was changing, there was no live scene mm. at the time. So, and we felt, and I think we did a gig in front of people, and they were all like 18 and 19, and we were 34 and 32, and it was just like, it didn't seem right. It just felt, we'd had our time, it was let it go, and Stone Roses came out, and we loved them so much, I so, yeah. <laughs> Well, they had come out a couple of years before, and we were thinking, let them, yeah, it's it's time. And so Ben went off to pursue his career, Tommy went off to work, and uh, and Paul, the guitarist, had left the band for a while by then, we had another guitar, and it, 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 I was playing. And so off we went, and um, I became a teacher, and had kids, and then 15 years later, age 50, I was 51, my dad died, and I was starting to write songs again anyway and the Christmas after my dad died my wife gave me seven uh, allowed me to spend 700 quid on a that telecaster you see there and it made me want to be a better guitarist so I started learning Radiohead and Joni Mitchell and I found myself writing okay and for three years I was didn't know what I wanted to write I was doing stuff just little songy things, thinking I'd write mature songs now. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Shit idea. Um, then I found myself. Was it? No, no, no yeah, no, no. I was uh, no, it was, uh, I was forty-seven when my dad died, and then fifty-one. I bought that Mac. 
Mm -hmm. So that's quite an elderly Mac, but it still works fine. And I logic, and I started wanting to do it properly again. And Did just, you feel something reignite that harkened back to the 80s when we were first doing it? Or was this it a, was a whole really new chapter? New. It was really, really new. Um, I felt... I had different thoughts in my head. I'd heard a lot of music. I loved Radiohead. And you, you must, with some of my slightly earlier songs, I don't know if last night there's much, apart from the last song, Sugar Pill is an obvious Radiohead connection and mm. it's like the keychain sort of stuff and that and all that. And But it's more, in, it's kind of funny because I'm more inspired by the people that Radiohead are inspired by. So Scott Walker and stuff like that and yeah. Nina Simone and... Oh, God, I can't even think now. But all sorts of bands, Talk Talk and things like that. I'm utterly inspired by bands like that. And Björk and Polly Harvey. Polly Harvey is the biggest influence on me in that you do what the fuck you like is yeah. her view and you make it quality. And I love Polly Harvey. I think she's my biggest hero. You know PJ Harvey, yeah? Yeah, yeah of course yeah, you do, of course yeah. you do. And of uh, course you do. Sorry, Roy. <laughs> no, no, it's fine. I didn't mean to right. be fucking insulting. No, but it's not. like, um, I... I did all that, and those, and I couldn't sing at all. Honestly, if I started singing, and my wife would just say, "Please get a singer." And I, there's this woman called Jo who worked at her school. Who had only ever done karaoke, and I heard her singing in the corridor, and she was pissed off with herself that she couldn't hit Adele's highest note. And I said to her, "You do know that woman's got like a four octave range, don't you? Which is extraordinary. Yeah, technical singer, absolutely extraordinary." And Joe had this beautiful sort of voice with a kind of lazy kind of um, delivery and an incredible sense of harmony. So I asked her to come and start singing some of my songs just on the here to see how it would go. Mm -hmm. uh, lots of the songs she liked that I had, she hated because she thought they were too grim. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, um, to my shame, the first, we did an LP together and there's a song on called Please, which... She hates, and I put it on, and I shouldn't have done. Mm. And I should have sung it. I should have saved it and sang it. And uh, so I think that one, they're all going to come down soon, uh, at the end of this year. I'm taking them all down, and I'm going to rejig them and put them back up, the earlier things, because of things like that, and I'll take that off for her. But she sang beautifully, and then I started writing songs around her voice. Mm -hmm. So it came up with the album Masts, which was... The best I thought was the best thing I'd ever done until that point, and it got nowhere because what do you do? You release it online and it gets totally and utterly ignored. Yeah. And exactly. there's a couple of stop frame animation videos I did for it, and we played a, a gig or two, and then. So when was this? Do that you, when oh, did Master God. come out? Um, do, 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 2014, I think there about 2014-15. So that's the since Heads on Sticks. That's the first no, that thing was you the first released. Thing, yeah. So, yeah. And so the first thing you released was with someone else. Yeah. So... Because I thought I couldn't sing, mm -hmm. but she insisted, there was a couple of songs on it, she insisted I sang because she thought I had a better voice for them than her. Did it take a while for you to it. find that confidence in yourself? And it took take a hell of a long time, time to get yeah. it in tune, I'll tell you. <laughs> was there a Eureka moment of, hey, that didn't sound too bad. Okay, I can do this. No, there's an awful lot. There's a lovely thing on Logic called uh, Pitch... <laughs> a pitch editor, and uh -huh. I was just dragging notes around. I wasn't yeah. doing auto correct because that sounds awful. Um, I think it's a horrible. It's used very well. I think um, Lamb use it really well. Lamb Chop, mm. uh, American band, is they're about my age, and the guy uses it to get falsetto, but he's got really, really good software. And he's really good. So I was just dragging things around, and by doing that, I learned what was wrong with my voice that all the notes just went down at the end and things like that and then Joe left and that was it and I thought I wouldn't do any more but a year later I had another set of songs because I couldn't stop writing uh -huh. so I thought fuck this I'm going to have to record myself because I thought I'm never going to find somebody as wonderful as her voice you haven't heard her voice I've played no. some of it yeah. but she um, absolutely wonderful wonderful voice and then I um, I just had to learn to sing myself so recording's one thing you can sing it again and again and again and again. And I found if I sang really softly, I could control the tone. Mm -hmm. And I also found I had quite a nice tone, quite a nice voice, quite a warm voice. Uh, a bit, I don't know, a bit croonerish in some ways. Okay. 
Okay. And they kind of suited certain like Sugar Pill. So I did an album called Sugar Pill. And I think you've played things off that and it had Redactor on it. Yes, yes, I have. And it's got a song called Troll Hunter on it, which I really like. And my favourite song on it is a song called Slow Worms. And it's kind of, it's quite radio heady in its way, but it's kind of, I just really like it. I love performing it. And it's got a song called Winter Takes Too Long, which I'm going to have to redo and sing that again. And I just really enjoyed the process. So what got me back into it was the process of creation, the process of having your own space that anything can happen. Yeah. And current software and current equipment, you don't have to spend an awful lot of money and you can do virtually anything. Yeah. I was giggling it like for 200 quid, I had a, a top quality recording studio in a box with a screen on it. Yeah. And yeah, okay, it's not as immediate as having a big desk and flying yeah. around and things like that, but, um, and having a room full of synths that you program and drum machines and things like that. But you can kind of do things. So the, it seems like you really turned the tap back on as far as writing is concerned. The, the material is coming. I couldn't stop it. There was a journey to was... let yourself take centre stage singing, at least for the recordings. What about performing? You, performed, <laughs> you made Masks okay. and you performed a gig with that. When you make Sugar Pills, or Sugar Pills the first album uh, you make by I yourself? I did nothing for seven months. And right. then I... I think it sold a few on iTunes, a couple of dozen or something like that, which is apparently is quite good because nobody buys music anymore. And yeah. um, but it got virtually no place on Spotify or anything like that. And I put it out through DistroKid, who are good, but you have to do the promotion yourself. Yeah. How could they? And I, I went to Old Street Records and the very wonderful Rosie Hopkins. And it was a quiet night, and I played three songs. And I sang for the very first time in public. I'd hardly even done anything with heads on sticks. I'd done a bit of sort of shouty backing vocals occasionally yeah. from behind the bass. Because the bass is quite a safe place to be. Because if you move, bass is about moving people's arses. And if you're moving yeah. their arses, you're doing your job. It doesn't matter what else you do. Yeah. You feel quite safe. And then um, it's a good place to listen to a band from as well and learn to write. But the. Uh, I was so nervous. I was shaking so much. I th- I, 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 she doesn't remember it like this at all so memory's a strange thing but I felt her elbow at least spirit, a hand on my elbow <laughs> get me on the stage and she said something like just place the first verse and chorus just with guitar uh-huh. just sat yourself down and I'm, I'm a decent guitarist and I played it and then I started singing and it was okay but even my wife who's adorable would say to me, I, I wasn't great at singing in tune. And so I had a couple of singing lessons. Uh, I learned, that's all I could afford, just two. And I learned that the singing teacher thought I had a really nice tone, a really good timbre, and what I had to do was learn to control pitch. And how you do that is not by blasting out loads of air, it's about controlling your diaphragm and your stomach muscles. and things like that so I started really working on the singing and when I did this album Ammonite I was really ambitious with the singing I wanted to sing there's a song called Little Fascist Heart it's about all the nasty shite people say about other people mm. and the psychology behind it really and I wanted to sing that one like a big singer from the 60s or something like that and really power it and mm. I pulled it off and I was really happy with that <laughs> But it, and I got it in one take, and I thought, oh, this, ooh, ooh, I'm getting somewhere. I've never recorded a song in one take before. I don't know if that's happened to you ever, but it was, like, mm. great. And I started doing poems on it, because I found out a decent voice to read, to say things, and yeah. doing things that would, like, run that. I've got a poem, and then there's a bit of, there's a sun chorus, and I found my range had gone from one octave it's <laughs> two octaves I'd learn okay. so which is workable it's not yeah. a proper singer's range but it's workable you know it's yeah. not Tom York or anybody <laughs> and I just started experimenting with falsetto and just fucking around and doing a lot of open mics so I had like your open mic and I, I think of all of them the Nelsons is the one I'll, I, I was coming back to I went the old sort of went couple, but I kept coming back to the Nelsons that was mainly for you Roy because mm-hmm. you made it good, you made it safe and comfortable and I was going to Old Street and there was this marvellous thing at uh, where we were last night mm-hmm. at um, P- 
paper dress vintage. paper dress called Noteworthy that was on every week with a guy called Jimmy Logic and a guy called Chu, a couple of rappers and Jimmy's a brilliant guitar player fantastic beatboxer and also a brilliant sound engineer so I, I could do fucking anything there I could go with my bass guitar in the looper pedal and loop up things uh, and surprise people yeah. that they didn't think I could really be experimental there and try out anything so I did trick finger blues with a looper for the first time there turned up with that little synth which I made all the drum sounds and bass sounds on Korg mini log yeah everybody Korg mini log 460 quid worth pure joy full note poly synth if you're into analog proper analog if you're into that sort of dirty messy sound <laughs> as I am it's a good toy to have a play with sometime and uh, and I looped it up on the looper pedal it's about 12 layers of loop including harmony vocals and it went down and it was packed and it went down really well so I just thought well this is interesting yeah so I started coming out and being a bit more exp- so when I went to the Reliance I had brought the looper didn't I yes you did and uh, did a bit on the looper and you drummed along to yeah Redactor, and I just loved playing Redactor with somebody drumming because it just felt like it was proper. Yeah. Yeah, and I don't know what else I did. I didn't do that John Grant cover, did I? I didn't do Greatest Motherfucker or something. I think I did just did my... Yeah. Did I do a John Grant cover? I think you did do John Grant, yeah. That's the first and only time I've done that, but I love that song. <laughs> I love singing it when I'm in a bad mood. And it's... Um, so... When was that? F- that first. That'd been a year mic. ago. That uh, my first open mic was two years ago. That was the that old Your, street one. Isn't it? Yeah. yeah, yeah, and I think Reliance was about, about a year, year ago. A year yeah. ago. Mm-hmm. And this is after Sugar Pill has been released. Yeah, this is. And Ammonite yeah. is the next album that you did. Album is that. That's, this is the one. Mass is what's just. So come I did Masts with Joe. Which she's got a beautiful voice. Ammonite. No, Sorry, sugar. um, I forget the order. Um, th- this is what happens when you get old, Roy. Uh, you forget things. Who yeah. am I? And get yeah, uh, sugar pill. Actually, my canoe club friends. Yeah, uh-huh. they used to because I'm forgetful and I say stupid things. They used to say to me, Gary, if you ever get Alzheimer's, how would anybody know? And it's just like, um, so I've always I've yeah. always had abusive friends who kept me real. It's very good. Yeah. So um, Ammonite has been the work of the last eighteen months because I've decided I wanted to get away from having obvious influences like Radiohead and Talk Talk and things like that behind me and Joni Mitchell and all sorts of things, recordings and things like that. And also I bought those two little analog synths, the Monolog, which is a, a mono synth, which is fabulous for bass and noises. And that thing, which is um, a poly synth, the mini log. And yeah. So it's been 700 quid for the pair of them. And then there's a few Roland like, drum pads you've got here <laughs> as well. And I had the, I bought that when I was working with Joe because I didn't, I got sick of trying to put drums in off the keyboard. Yeah. And I can play drums reasonably well. Not as, oh, not, I can't pretty. play a kit anymore. Because oh, yeah. you have to practice to play a kit. And, yeah. uh, so you've got the Roland Octopad. The first. Roland Octopad, or Octopus as a friend of mine calls it, yeah. <laughs> And then the other Roland is, and I bought that this summer uh, after that incident with the looper pedal at yours. Yeah, there's one time at the Nelsons. When yeah, the that's just a, you can't yeah. have everything going out of one channel. It's yeah. just so I can put whole backing tracks on that. Oh, they're not backing tracks. They're most of the song. I can have yeah. loops on that. I can have any samples. It's a sampling drum bag. Yeah, it's not as nice to play as the. I gave you the nice one to play. Yeah, it was the octopus that, that I was playing. That, last that, night. You played the octopus, and I played the SPD SX, which sort of sounds like some sort of disease. <laughs> it's bit, not yeah. a great name, but it's it's a something drum pad, basically. Yeah, so um, it, it feels as though you found a groove. You've got the writing happening. You're more confident in your recording yeah. and your performance. And voice. I've been. It's been weird. I never ever expected to get complimented for singing. And from about nine months ago, I was at Old Street and I played a song, which I haven't recorded yet, called um, Hold Me Down. Mm-hmm. And it's just, it uses my full range and softer, loud and everything like that. And it's quite a nice song. I think I must have played it in the Nelsons. And it's what I play when I'm feeling nervous because I know I can perform it really well. And it went down really well. And I had these two women come up, tell me what a beautiful voice I had. And I sounded like Guy Garvey out of Elbow. And I went, fuck me, I'm not that good. <laughs> I almost said that to them. I just went, yeah, what are you on? I think yeah. I went. And then I played, uh, 
a week later I played, what did I play? I played this song called Clear Water, which is off the first album. And that this woman came up and she told me that I made her cry. Wow. And I just, and of course, I couldn't help myself. I went, it wasn't that bad, was it, love? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Shall I pay for the therapy? Um, yeah. And she just went, it just got to her. And I started getting, and I, don't, I don't think I'm a singer, but I've, I've started getting people saying things like, your voice shakes the bass bins, and, you, you know, and it's warm, and it's like, yeah. it, you've got this cage of guitar, and you've got this warm, very human voice in the middle of it. And I know I don't hit all the notes right, and yeah. I know all this. And uh, and then I was at the, uh, what's it called? Oh, shit, it's in Southwark, um, the Gladstone. And I did the open mic there, and this is, I don't know if you've met Valerio Lysander. No, I haven't. He's one of my, he could sing, he sings like Tom York. Yeah. Oh, wow. Uh, and possibly a bit better, because he's got a big, it's got a good big sound as well. He can really belt it out. Mm-hmm. and he writes these beautiful, beautiful songs, including some in Italian. And I went on after him, <laughs> and I thought, oh. I'm going to die. <laughs> <laughs> and I played a song called The Wonder, which is off the first album. It's one of the ones I sing on the first album, which is kind of a song about Tony Blair, really, and people who disappoint the fuck out of you, and it's all done in tremolo, picky, finger-picky guitar, and it's, um, bluesy. And then and that one and then I sang Vacuum or Hold Me Down as it's called. And Valerio came up and told me how much he liked it and he started giving me singing tips and getting me to do a smile face when I was hitting a big a high note and things because yeah. you get more upper harmonics that way he was saying and it's easier to hold the note and oh. give me things about breathing and so I notice when you breathe you get really tense when you're holding the note. He says, Try and relax your stomach when you hold and he's just a, and I thought this is really nice, and I felt really accepted. A little bit as a performer, but much more as a human being. Yeah. And there's that thing being a 58-year-old guy, being the twen- older than anybody else in the room by 20 years, quite often. Mm. And I wasn't last night, because Grant was there, and Rob, which was great. And there was a really old guy at the end, <laughs> at the back, wasn't there? <laughs> yeah. Did he have his dog? I think there was a guy with a dog in the back. The dog. Yeah, there so you I, go. I did say he would be playing to a dog. Your prediction came true. The dog liked it. I'm not <laughs> sure. He, he particularly liked your set, I think. Um, but oh, right. uh, he was woofing along to that, yeah. yeah definitely. Actually, I wonder, because you have been in, to put it bluntly, the music industry in the 80s, even if at the time you weren't really sure what you were we doing. Were, we weren't in the industry. You were, you were just we were doing the thing. edges of, of trying to be in it. Yeah. So what you were doing then and what you were doing now, how, what is your perspective? Like, how do you see things, how it worked back then and how it works now? Because essentially both times, right. you, you've flown outside the coop, so to speak. You're doing your own thing. You're not, you weren't knocking the doors of labels and trying to worm your I way was, into major... I was, but there were things like 4AD and um, yeah. Mute and things that we, people we really admired who we were never really going to be their sort of band. Yeah. Yeah. Do you feel uh, that we'd way have now been, as well? if we should have come from Manchester because we'd definitely been a factory band. We'd yeah. have been the other. <laughs> yeah. We'd have been the second factory funk band, I think. Uh, uh, we went to Pills label and because we love Public Image Limited, who were described as paranoia. You can dance to. I thought <laughs> yeah. that, that would have been even better than what we got. <laughs> but um, and I loved Public Image and we uh, that kind of and I loved the slits and all that sort of stuff. So we t- we tried to talk to Ireland Records, but they weren't interested in other people like that. And it was kind of... Back then, there weren't as many musicians, because you could get gigs, and there was a live scene, and especially early on, late 70s, early 80s, you could almost get gigs at will. So we'd be off to Portsmouth University, and they'd pay 300 quid to drive down and play a gig, and we were an unheard of band. Mm. So you didn't really make any money, but you kind of covered your expenses for playing the gig. Yeah. And sometimes there's a great song by the members. Is it the members? I can't remember. But there's this great... No, Nightingales did a great song. I forget who, but they had this line in it about cottage industry. Yes, the Nightingales cottage industry. Slave driver, here's your fiver. Yeah, which was talking about the music scene back then. Yeah. And it was just this great lyric. It was brilliant. The court, it, it, you got bugger all money. And we thought that was bad. And then later on, when we got to tour, play, so we'd play like, like the Rock Garden or something, and we'd get 50 quid. 
and we'd fill it. And it, it wasn't fair, and we'd play other places and they try to nick your gear, but it, you know, that still happens. Yeah. And they'd try and claim that my Roland D50 synthesizer worth 1500 quid was theirs. Wow. And I'd go, uh, it's got my name painted on the bottom and my address. Shall we get the police in now? Yeah, exactly. And it was like that. And uh, I, I used to play rugby and do judo and stuff. Um, I just sat on them. <laughs> <laughs> Literally, I just sat on them and dribbled on the yeah. face. Probably. You can like, handle like an overexcited dog, you know. Um, I, well, I can't handle myself, but I'm. I got bullied as a kid, and I, I will not let people. That's why I got upset the other night yeah. with your guy. Yeah, yeah, but he wasn't being physical, so that was all right. If he tried to be physical, I would have carried him out. Wouldn't have hurt him. I'd have picked him up. I'd have carried him out and put him down gently outside and told him to go home. Yeah. And you know, <laughs> when you're seventeen stone, you don't need, you know, people don't, and you've got a wonky eye. People don't try it on. Well, cross touch wood. Touch wood. Yeah. Touch wood <laughs> yeah. And all that. So how about now? Now, because again, you're making music. now. Uh, so back then, it, I think I'm sorry. I'm, I'm no, no, ramble. Okay. Okay. Please feel free to cut that bit out. Um, back then you got a chance to do gigs you got, you could get some interest if you played well at gigs because you'd be playing gigs with other people who brought an audience yeah you didn't have to fight to, you didn't have to phone all your mates to bring an audience and all this sort of stuff people yeah. would come anyway the people went to gigs yeah exactly. and they don't now there also wasn't that many bands because people would try it for a few months and give up mm-hmm and it was the persistent buggers, like, yeah. uh, the ones that were kind of hooked, really, who keep pushing, keep yeah. pushing. And um, and also there was this gatekeeper sort of thing, because you could only get a record out, and it was independent. La- the independent label scene was really good. I mean, remember Oasis got going on independent label, didn't they? Alan Creation. All that. Creation Records, yeah. yeah. And you had this independent record scene, not even Red Rhino, so, you know, and their offshoot, Dead Men's Curve, it was a guy called Dave, basically. It was one man. So you had these one-man operators. Oh, the, the Undertones and their record label and all, all these kind of bands. Yeah. And independent reggae labels and all, all sorts of stuff. And um, Because it, on the one hand, now, as you mentioned, now there's nothing. That now there's nothing. And the money is not in the record labels or the bands. Nobody even buys CDs anymore. But okay. vinyl's coming up. So yeah. uh, I've got a thing to say about vinyl, but um, the money's made by Spotify now. So you get 0.04 pence to play on Spotify or something, yeah. or even less than that. So you have to have 200 plays to make a penny. Exactly. Uh, 20 plays to make? Oh, I can't do them. <laughs> I'm a math teacher and I can't do maths. Uh, you sort of, um, but you have to have so many plays just to make a penny. So it's something like 2 million plays, you'll get 2,000 quid. Bugger all. Yeah, and, and and they're making the money, or you put stuff on YouTube, and they make the money. Yeah. So there's a few. It's like that thing. There's a very, very, very few who make a lot of money on it, and the rest of it, because it's all about the advertising. It's all about that, and it's all owned by a few very, very, very big people. Yeah. So even big bands don't make a lot of money on recordings anymore. They make them on their tours, don't they? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so it's like, um, I think Radiohead do all right, and people like that, but then they deserve to. Yeah. And, uh, but so, it's that kind of thing, and it's. I think it's so much harder for your generation than the generations. But there's also, there's a hell of a lot of you. So what's allowed me to do it, this 200 quid recording studio I've got stuck in my mat there, mm-hmm. these 700 quid, you're talking about a synth that powerful would have been over... A, 1500 quid when I was doing it then think about the differential in money yeah yeah a little mono synth like that the only thing you were buying an art or a moog and they were like you know 900 quid or whatever the drum machines were like 600 quid um and even the shit ones <laughs> though that was just a, a sampler with two gigabytes in it was unheard of and you know and when I started doing house music I had a sampling keyboard and it had two megabytes in it. Ooh. We've come some way. Yeah. Yeah, okay. And so the technology is there. To, anybody can make music to a very high level. Mm-hmm. You had that success of Ray Black the other year, didn't you? Yeah. Um, she did an al- album at home, didn't she? Yeah. And it's fabulous. It sounds amazing. And with enough care, enough skill, enough determination, you can acquire the skills as you go on. You can start making your album 
and you can just keep crafting and crafting it as you acquire more skill and you can get there so therefore it's open to everyone so therefore that's wonderful because you've got this huge range of music therefore it's also shit because there's no gatekeepers and yeah. there's everybody out there competing for no less than less money yeah so to make a living out of music now the, the it feels like it's harder yeah easy to make the and, music and therefore I, I feel a, a bit guilty that I'm at <laughs> times that I'm in, in the market too and but I've no, I've no ambition to make money out of this. I've I've none, but I, I do. Do you feel you found a good routine to keep making music though? Are you already kind of putting an eye towards what comes after Ammonite and onwards and onwards? I've got songs, but I've at the minute I'm so. It takes such an effort. You've got everything recorded, then you have to mix it. Yeah. And you keep coming back for weeks to mixes, and going. Uh, what's the song? Uh, we run. We uh, we lost. Yeah. I didn't add the harmonic bass play and the bass slides on it. I had mixed it already, and I went back and added some harmonic, some bass parts, just little bits near the end, and little slides and little twinkles and a few of the little sort of found sounds in there. Yeah. In the little harmony where where I sing, oh, we thank you for saving the day. But you didn't, and then I did like a, using the pitch thing, take my own voice, sing as high as I could, and then drag a note around. Yeah. Did a little female harmony on that, and it just makes that moment just come out of nowhere. And it's it's that you get so deeply lost in the thing. And so at the minute I can't even I can't think ahead. And then I mastered it. I mastered it at home because it's a hundred quid a track to get it mastered. I don't have that money. Yeah. And they could do a crap job. I know what I want it to sound like. So I've got some mastering software in there, which I bought. It's not 108 quid's worth that I bought. And this is what's happened over the last 10 years. I've gradually acquired bits. Yeah. <laughs> the, <laughs> the studio has grown and grown and grown. Uh, it's not gonna, it, I don't think it needs to grow much more. There's a couple of yeah. other synths I'd like that aren't expert. They're a couple of hundred quid, 300 quid each. And but what about the live show? You've, you've got a lot of equipment <laughs> you bring with you on the stage. Yeah. You've talked a lot about the open mics you've done, you're getting yeah. out there and making, yourself, making people Last aware of what you Last night was the first proper live show. I've, uh, I've, done, I've done a few little gigs mm -hmm. where I've taken the bitter kit. Yeah. Like I've done it with the synth and the looper pedal. And I've come to yours with the... I brought the drum pad the other time, didn't yeah. I, at Nelson's. And it was, that was a bit easier to manage for you. Wasn't it? <laughs> it was, yeah, separate input. And I think yeah. it, was, it was like... It's learning, because if I'm using a lot of kit and you're playing a couple of songs... It's not fair on the people if they're worrying, even if they're just worrying about, oh, how the hell? So if you've got it all taped together and it's one plug that goes into the power yeah. and one plug that goes into there, or with, I did um featured artist slot at uh, Old Street a couple of weeks ago and I said to Rosie, is it okay if I have two DIs? But I said it right at the beginning of the night and she went, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and she was just lovely with it. But it, it's that kind of thing. It's about remembering you've got to make it easy for everybody yeah. else. So, did you notice everything was gaffer taped together last night? Yes, yes, I did. So I could just move the three bits. Exactly. But it's and the live setup is that I can now I can play drums live, which we did last night. I can use that for back for the 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 tracks basically the the major part of the tracks. So I'm sick of it being heard not as it's meant to be. Yeah. I don't want to do stripped down acoustic guitar versions of my stuff. Not really. No. There's some songs I play that sound. I it's like playing them just the that, guitar. Yeah. Like I did Sugar Pill at the end. It works really well with just yeah. the guitar, doesn't it? Because it's about the it's about the tune and the song. But not everything I do is about the tune and the song. Yeah. So it's about the feel and the sound and the space and all this sort of stuff. So fuckload of echo boxes. Yeah. Looper pedal. Uh huh. <laughs> Um, those two drum devices, that's in. Ideally, I'd quite like to bring this one along. And I'm monologue. thinking that, yeah, start, yeah, I'm thinking about starting to MIDI things up because I can do loops on, I can do loops on that, I can do loops on that, I can do things on sequences on that, sequences on that. So I could be, in terms of creating a new piece of music in front of people, yeah, which I like to do. I can start off something, have a little loop running, and then just build on it with you know with lots of other loops that I've thought about and but that that's it I think I've got where I need to be and unless I had a band 
how many people do you think I need in my band? <laughs> <laughs> Would they fit on the stage? Exactly, how, how big a stage are we talking here? Yeah, exactly. Fit on one I yeah. mean, a drummer, a percussion, minimum drummer, percussionist, bass player, somebody on synths, or a couple of people on synths, probably uh, another guitar player, me, and a couple of backing singers. That's nine by my count. And uh, and the trumpet, and the, and the brass section. Because <laughs> <laughs> I like brass band music, so it's like... Quite a few, quite, quite a few. It, so I don't know. I I think uh, I've just got a. Uh, have I got a settled way? No, I haven't got a settled way. I write with the loop pedal. I write with my ukulele. I pick up. I've got acoustic guitar upstairs. I mainly write on that. I I make things on the computer with chords and stuff like that and beats and yeah. and everything's played. I don't take samples from anyone. Everything yeah. has to be. Because that's the discipline. But, um, okay. now, I think you're in a great place with the equipment you've got, your mindset as far as recording and writing, and seeing you on stage last night, seeing you in your full glory, getting to join you <laughs> in that as well. I oh, have, that was so nice of oh, you. That was, that, so was, that was fun for me. Forget you. I was having a great time. Thank you so much for letting me be part of it. Oh, you're welcome. Both your set and the night in general. Yeah, that well, first show I put on at Road Trip in June... With, I wouldn't have done this one without that. So yeah, I'm, and I I'm wouldn't really have done that I wanted you. to make a really good thing for you guys as well, because of that. And several, I, other, lots of very nice moments. Yeah. I think people, everybody I talk to keeps talking about you as like the nicest man I've ever met. <laughs> I'm sure you can be evil when you want to be, but it's <laughs> like, um, but, and you go out of your way to make things good for other people. And I think, I hope that makes you feel good, because I think what that does is it sets up I'm going to use the word karma, but I don't, I don't know what I mean by it. But it sets up that kind of karmic thing where everybody then starts wanting to contribute. Yeah. And I think what we're mainly doing when we're doing the opening mic scene is a bunch of mates playing songs to each other. Yeah, exactly. Is what we're mainly doing. Because quite a lot of our audience last night was musicians. Yeah. <laughs> uh, wasn't it? Inclu- including us. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But that's all right, because yeah. they're interested, you know. Exactly. And it's... They, um, and therefore it's a community it's not a competition and I hope you and Delilah and everybody make 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 it fucking massive I hope you all do incredibly well and if I get to play lots and lots more lovely gigs like that and one or two people buy a record off me <laughs> that'd be great that, that'll days. do me yeah Gary, yeah. thank you so much for talking to me. Thank you for letting me be part of last night as well. Ammonite is the new album that's available online. Not Get yet. It will be available online. In a couple of weeks, yeah. Vinyl? Uh, what I want to do, um, I had 50 CDs made up, mm-hmm. of which I sold three last night. Um, <laughs> and I'm hoping, and I'm, what I'm doing, and the strategy, I'm going to go around to local record stores, mm-hmm. and I'm going to ask, uh, there's a couple in... Um, if they'll take stuff independently produced. I'm going to have a chat. I'm going to see if go down to Rough Trade Records and see, have a chat with them because they're a brilliant record store and they've been there for donkey's years and they've championed independent music. Yeah. And to see if they'll take just some CDs, to see if anybody's interested. Yeah. And maybe if, if they like it, if they'll play a track or two on their playlist. Yeah. And if I raise, I need to raise about a grand, I think, or 1,200 quid to produce 200 Vinyl LPs, which is the lowest amount you can really make okay. for not ridiculous amounts of money. Yeah. Because it's quite a process. And I want to put things out in vinyl because the cover art would look good big and because more people are buying... this For your listeners, mm-hmm. from what I hear, more people are buying vinyl now than are buying CDs and vinyl sales are going up. Yeah. Because they're a beautiful object. They are. It's not just about being able to... The music itself sounds good, but the yeah. object is the work of art that you want to keep and treasure yeah. and show off, so to speak. And people like me make albums. We yeah. carefully... I wrote about 28 songs over the last 18 months, 22 years, and there's 12 on the album. Or maybe 11, I haven't quite decided yet. When <laughs> they finished, well, I'll just clip the last one off. And it tells a story and it goes through a set of moods. And mm. I think that's... I'll... I'll I don't think albums are dead. Well, they might be, but they're not dead to me. 
So if anyone listening to this wants to support you and help you reach your goal to make the vinyl happen, <laughs> what's the best place to find you, find your music? Oh, um, well, you can go on Spotify and find its own animal. There's two albums out there. There will be an, another one soon. There's Masks, which is the first one I did about four or five years ago with Joe. And you've got to hear Joe's voice to be, be believed. And it's kind of bitty. I think the songs are all good, but they're in too many different styles, maybe, for some people. For me, I don't care. Uh-huh. And then there's Sugar Pill, which I'm immensely proud of, because that's all me. And it's really pushing it. It's me really, really pushing the songwriting and, and the style and the production sort of stuff. Um, very, And then Ammonite will be out either the end of this month or very early in October. I just, I don't want to put it out until it's yeah done. Absolutely. And because and, and, uh, it's, who knows if I'll get, you, you never know, will I get a chance to do another one? Will I have the time to, 18 yeah. months where I spent all my spare time writing music? <laughs> yeah. Because it's got to be good, there's no point in, I don't want to put out crap, I don't want to. Mm. And if people want to do that, I've got a couple of videos on YouTube, if you look up It's Own Animal, there's a Facebook page which is also It's Own Animal, which hasn't got enough stuff on it yet, but it'll build. Yeah, and I've got one song on Go Out of Tune, which is a, a YouTube channel of me doing a really spaced out version of um, my song Steel Wall, which is just it, the guitar kind of sounds like an orchestra because it's got more echo boxes than exist in the actual universe <laughs> on it, and, and all that because that's I like echo and reverb. And if you like echo and reverb, listeners, then you know exactly where to go to get more of yeah. that. Gary, thank you so much for your time. Hey, uh, I'm, I'm sorry if I've gone on too much, no, no. but you have to watch Geordie's. <laughs> yeah. Here's to the next one. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Roy. And that was that. Thank you so much, Gary, for talking to me, for putting on that show, for letting me be part of it, for playing my show. It's been wonderful knowing you and wonderful playing with you. And thank you also for letting me join you in your set. I really was going all out at the front row for his performance because I know every time I've seen him perform it's been great but I just know he's must have been thinking oh but there's so much more and I can't quite get it all across on this small stage all of us that played that night Juliet and Nanette Delilah Black and Buckley and its own animal we we have a little bit of a crew at the Nelsons my Thursday night and I felt like the Nelsons was very much represented at this show There's just a good vibe between the four of us. We've also joked that I've put on a show with all four of us. Gary's put one on with all four of us. And now it's Delilah and Buckley's turn, or maybe it's Juliet's turn, to host a show and have us all support them. Watch this space. We'll see what happens. But regardless, I've had a great time with them so far. And I'm sure there'll be many more instances of us playing together. And I'm so glad I got a chance to really capture Gary's story in its entirety. There's a lot I can relate to. Be having an interest in something, being really attracted to something, but feeling as though you lack the skill that everyone else has. Before I started this podcast, I would go to a bunch of shows by myself, and to a certain degree, it would feel as though everyone else is inside having a great time, and I'm on the outside with my nose pressed up against the glass, watching them and wishing I could be inside as well. And then to a certain extent, almost gleefully reveling in the fact that I was on the outside and I wasn't inside with everyone else. So the way he talked about how he, when he first came to London, what it was like before he started the band. Yeah, I can definitely sympathise with that. I am glad that he did find his people and he found his calling. And as we've heard quite a few times on this podcast, there was a period where he put it all to the side and I had no for lack of a better term, got on with his quote-unquote real life, you know, get a job, start a family, all that type of thing. But I am again grateful that music found its way back into the forefront of his mind and he got back to performing it, back to recording it. It is an interesting setup he has. There were a few times when he was gesturing towards synth, so I, I, on the podcast you might not get what it is he's talking about, but he's generally talking about the instruments that he has in his, I was going to say makeshift studio, but it doesn't feel like a makeshift studio. It feels like a studio. Though you might have heard some footsteps from upstairs. I think his son might have been in the house. So 
Hopefully that wasn't too distracting. Sunday was a fantastic night. I had a great time playing with my band once again. And I have dates for my next few shows at Road Trip and the Workshop. They are, if you want to get your diaries and pens out, Tuesday 29th of October, Tuesday 26th of October of November, and Tuesday 17th of December. That's Tuesday 29th of October, Tuesday 26th of November, and Tuesday 17th of December. More details to come. Watch this space. You know what you should do, as well as going back and listening to my interviews with everyone else from the lineup for that show. Once again, that's Juliet and Nanette, episode 128, Delilah Black and Buckley, episode 137, and Gary on episode 146. Go back to the start of this episode, just listen to it again. Really, really drink in his story, because it's a fascinating one, and it has quite a happy ending in how that show went on Sunday night. But that's enough from me. You don't need me talking your ear off anymore. Go and listen to Gary. He's an expert at talking your ear off because he does it so well. Thank you all very much for listening. Feel free to reach out to me. I am Saddest Night Out on social media and Saddest Night Out at gmail.com if email is your preferred form of communication. And I will catch you on the next episode. I just might, might be recording two today. So again, as always, watch this space. But thank you for joining me. And I'll catch you on the next one. Thanks again, Gary, and take care.